Good evening, and welcome to another episode of Generation Grip, where we explore hard-hitting topics from the perspective of Generation Z. Tonight, we'll be discussing critical race theory. Let's meet our panel. Joining me here is Olivia Batiste. Olivia is a junior at DSST Conservatory Green. She will be entering her third year with CYC and couldn't be more excited to be a member. She enjoys public speaking and learning about global issues and history. When she's not studying, she can be found binge watching dramas, baking, or listening to music. Sitting beside Olivia is Clarice Reikley. Clarice is a senior at Denver School of the Arts where her major is creative writing. This is her third year in CYC. She's incredibly passionate about environmental justice, women's liberation, and helping people tell their stories. When she's not organizing with CYC, Clarice can be found reading poetry with her cat, Rita. Yes. Clarice and Olivia are both here on behalf of Colorado Youth Congress. Let's see what CYC is all about. <laughs> Think about the power that is in this circle. Think about what we can create together and what we will create together. I am Daniela Montano. I go to the City College. My name is Mohammed. Uh, I go to school at the SST College of High School. My name is Noor. I am 17. I have shout out. My name is Sam Batten, and I'm the founder of the Colorado Youth Congress. What I've heard from my students is that they want a seat at the table, that their education should not be passively learning in chairs, that they should be working with others to enact positive change in the world. Coming together as a community, I think we're so much stronger in being able to do projects together. It works a lot better when you have people from all around the community. Who would be shocked at the level of brilliance, empathy, critical thinking, and power that our young people have? Colorado Youth Congress supports students as they take that power and channel it to create a future that is just and equitable. A future where we can all thrive together. I got to see the deeper side of other people and I got to see like I'm not alone in this situation. I could see things from other people's perspective and in some way I felt closer to them. Our mission at the Colorado Youth Congress is to build and inspire a diverse community of young people to drive inclusive systems level change. We do that three ways. First, we bring students together from across schools to take on civic change projects. Whether that's education, the environment, access to healthy food, changing our voting laws, whatever it is that students feel most passionately about, we support them in that with access to coaching and financial resources to take their idea and turn it into reality. Second, we work with teachers and school districts and schools to help make their civics classes actionable. And third, we connect students to opportunities to advocate for the issues they care most passionately about. If more students were given the opportunity to speak up, or if more students had the opportunity to go to programs like these, uh, things would be a lot different. You would see like greater changes in schools. You will see greater changes just everywhere. We do this work so that young people can build real relationships across lines of difference. We do this work so that young people have the knowledge and skills and social capital to bring about the positive change that they seek. We do this work so that we can strengthen our democracy. We all deserve the opportunity to thrive. We all deserve to be represented in decision making. We all deserve the right to be agents of change in our lives, our communities, in the systems and institutions which govern us. This is the future we want to live in, but the membership of the Colorado Youth Congress are not waiting for the future. We're creating it. And if you believe in the power of young people, then join us. I wanted to actually start doing something instead of just sitting around and talking about it. And so I think your organization is a great way for me to actually like get out there and think about what I can do that would make a tangible difference in my community. Think about what we can create together and what we Pretty awesome organization. You guys have been in it for multiple years, right? Yes. So I guess you like it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, our expert for tonight is Joshua Trinidad. Joshua served in Denver Public Schools for 10 years. He's an advocate for equity and scholar of ethnic studies and critical race theory. Joshua currently 
serving as the first diversity and inclusion officer for YAI in New York. Happy to have you, Joshua. Can you define critical race theory for us and paint a picture of what it looks like in practice? Yes. Um, well, critical race theory began, um, you know, a lot of folks would say it began in the mid 1970s, but it really began um, in the 1960s with a lot of movements coming out of the black and brown community, specifically um, out of the Black Panther movements and um, the Brown Beret Chicano movement. Um, but it originated actually out of some early writings and uh, legal scholars such as Derek Bell, um, where folks in the legal world were beginning to question and to challenge laws in which they were created and, up, and, and upheld in the intersection of race. And um, really just um, thinking through um, a few different things. Um, one of them being how does, how does race play a part in how um, a lot of the laws were not only created, but how do they affect specifically brown and black folk um, in, in communities across the United States. Um, you know, CRT also, um, it also looks at intersectional work outside of race. Um, it can also look at uh, even some other pieces that we are now looking at um, outside of race besides uh, disabilities, abilities, um, socioeconomic statuses, which we can see correlations with race, but have extended to, to, to such extents. And so today, now it's extended more outside of the legal world. Um, we now see it playing a big part in um, the educational world. We see it being used um, throughout health, um, health systems, housing um, systems, banking systems, that we now know how to ask questions such as, do white people get advantage um, in certain situations because it was created by white folk? Um, or do people that are minoritized continue to suffer uh, based upon uh, laws and rules that were not created for them to, to thrive? Um, so in essence, that's, that's what CRT begins to challenge. And uh, furthermore, you know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful scholarly look to, to continue to, to, to ask these questions. Um, even today um, in, in, our, in our modern time. So, Olivia, what got you interested in this subject? Yeah, so I've been involved in racial justice work since my freshman year, um, and it was after reading The Other Westmore, which really got me into like the differences um, and how like two people who are similar, grew up in the same environment, can end up in like two completely different areas of life. Um, due to like no fault of their own, just the area that they're in. And I think after reading that, it really opened up my eyes to everything that's going on in the world. And you, how'd you get interested yeah. in, in critical race theory? Definitely, um, I got interested in critical race theory. I've done a lot of work with this, or, well, it's like a class in school, an elective called National History Day. And I've done it for about six years and every year you kind of compete with the topic. And as I started doing it, um, it made me really realize how much of the history is taught by the conquerors, the white people, anybody who is um, very privileged in these ways. And it's gotten me really interested in telling the histories of those who have been historically disenfranchised and written out of history. History. And so that was definitely the starting off point for me getting more interested in learning about critical race theory and reading more about it um, and acting on it with Colorado Youth Congress as well. Why do you guys think that there's so much controversy around whether critical race theory should be taught in schools mm -hmm. or not? Um, yeah, I think it's because so many generations have been taught with um, mm -hmm. this like false depiction of um, history and being told that we live in a post-racial society, um, that everybody gets along when in fact like there are a lot of things holding people back in America and so now having to confront the ways that they've contributed to that um, and the ways that they still contribute to that I feel like it's very shocking for many people um, and they don't really want to face it because it requires them to dig deeper into their own actions and who they are as a person. 
Completely, yeah. And I think if our generation and so many people living today were awoken to the real reality of what was happening in the past and the truth of both the harms that were being committed and the liberation that was taking place, the duality of it, we would be so much more powerful. Um, I think if we know where we've come from, it allows us to not commit the same uh, excuse me, atrocities into the future and allows us to move into a future that's more equitable where these same horrors won't be. Um, created again. So. When you study history, is it comforting for you or is it turbulence? Mm. Is, it, is it tough? Um, it's a mix. I think sometimes I have to put the book down because I'm just like so enraged and so emotional. Um, but honestly, at other times, reading about black women and like our resilience throughout history, I feel so empowered and so happy for our future. Um, and I just am filled with like so much pride for our people. Mm. So um, it's it's a mixture. <laughs> How about you? When yeah. you read history, is it up and down? Mm -hmm. Is it is it yeah. prideful? Is it hurtful? Totally. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of pain that I feel, especially um, spent. I have a lot of Irish ancestry, and my mom lives in Ireland part time. So learning about the colonization that my own ancestors um, faced in Ireland, and then fled to America, inflicted on the same indigenous people of America is such a duality um, that, I'm con that I'm constantly kind of addressing and really seeking to understand the ways that I uphold these systems of power and oppression today. And so history is really challenging to swallow sometimes, especially as a white person. And it also, going back long enough into Irish history before Ireland was colonized has really helped me dream into an era where um, I can, where, pardon me, has helped me dream into an era where these wrongs of the past can be righted and hopefully we can dream into a future that's again more equitable. Um, so that's what's coming to mind. Uh, Joshua, critical race theory revolves around systematic racism. What evidence do we have to prove that racism is a systematic issue? Yeah, well one thing I wanna, I wanna say real quickly is just listening to the students uh, speak is, um, first of all, just wonderful to hear and their impression and understanding of how critical race theory functions and their, their impressions is just, um, it's so beautiful to hear. Um, and knowing um, that, you know, I, I, I reflect on myself as, as, a, as a youth growing up and I didn't know um, as much as um, the individuals that are with us today um, about critical race theory, because it it wasn't we we were we were at a, uh, a point where we thought everything was gone, um, that everything was better, and that uh, you know that um, race wasn't an issue. Um, but as we have stated many times just a few moments ago, that it continues to not be an issue necessarily, but it is at the forefront of this work that is needed to continue for equitable um, learning. So I just want to commend the young folks with us today that um, their knowledge is just um, beyond where I think many of us were um, at this time, maybe in, in our learning. So congratulations on, on doing the work and, and being so knowledgeable with the work. Um, you know, ways that we see systematic racism existing in, um, in, in today's society, you know, I'll talk about schooling specifically, is, um, you know, we can see it within honors programs, um, within schools. You know, some students are set up for success based upon maybe their, their background, the things that they have advantages to, um, so that they can begin to separate and segregate students within schools. And we think that segregation has ended, but as we take a deeper look, even into Denver Public Schools, we will see that there are multiple tracks of learning that are happening within a single building. And um, you can see it um, just by looking in from one classroom into another. And I have been a principal um, at multiple schools in Denver. And, um, you know, it's a very hard thing to dismantle because you are up against many, many different types of folks. You're up against a community um, of white folks that uphold 
uh, white supremacy, thinking that um, segregation um, is, is not happening, but it actually is, and to help teach that community that we do need to dismantle and bring folks together for learning um, is important. Um, that's a very hard thing to do in 2020, uh, 2021. And so what I will say is that um, racism hides itself in many different places, like gifted education. You know, a lot of those opportunities only afford themselves to folks that, um, that are white or affluent or that have opportunities to get students' transportation to events um, that they can uh, attend. You know, that's one thing I wanna, I wanna ask um, the students on the couches. You know, have you noticed these things in school where you start to question like, why are they over there? Why am I not with that group? Um, why wasn't I selected to be part of certain groups of, academic, of academia? Um, I'm just wondering, you know, have you ever encountered that? Um, because that's that's a form of racism that exists um, in schooling. I think that's the question for you right there. Have you guys encountered something like that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think even as young as elementary school, um, being blocked from entering certain programs despite meeting all the requirements for the programs and even excelling them, not understanding the teacher's reasoning of like, oh, you can't enter this area and being confused. Um, when I was younger, I didn't fully understand what was going on, um, but my mom did. So I always had my mom to help um, like empower me um, and advocate for me. And so I always did end up in those classes. But if I did not have my mom, um, then I most definitely would not be in the classes I'm in now, right. um, have like the grades that I have now. So it's just it just pains me to think about other students who do not have parents like mine, um, who aren't able to advocate for themselves. Right. What about you? Did you, did you, did yeah. you felt in like segregated mm, situations most definitely, at school? Yeah, and definitely kind of on the inverse, I think, of Olivia. Um, I did, for full disclosure, go to a gifted and talented elementary school that was actually on the corner of five points and I think in, in many ways kind of has participated in the gentrification um, that's happening in five points. But aside from that, I've definitely, even going to Denver School of the Arts now, it's largely affluent, mostly white, and it's been um, really awakening to be in CYC and to be surrounded by so many people who um, have a lot of different life experiences from me and are able to share their perspectives on these things. It's really broadened my worldview and just made me more aware of the inequities that I've participated in in schooling and the ways that I've had a lot of privileges that aren't provided to um, black indigenous people of color. So, yeah. Do you guys think that there are m more students that are interested in these things like you are or is there less students that yeah. care about these issues as yeah. much as you do like do you guys think that you're like mm -hmm. a, a smaller group of, mm -hmm. of students or do you think that like the student body cares about mm -hmm. these types of issues yeah um i think that everybody cares about these types of issues i think it's just the environment that they grew up in so if they didn't grow up in an environment where it was like where activism was known, um, advocating for others. Um, these things will be like in the back of their mind, but they won't actively like look for them because they weren't exposed to that. Um, also, just like people show up for others in different ways. There's like no standard way of activism, no standard way of helping other people. Um, so I do think that a lot of students are interested in these issues. It just shows up in different ways that people may not be able to notice. Most definitely, and kind of on that note, I completely agree. Um, and I think too what's so challenging in schools is that maybe students don't realize that they're not having the resources and the education about critical race theory and about the true history of the United States and like the cut and dry and not trying to euphemize it or anything like that. Um, I think students don't know that they need that until it's told to them or they learn it like on social media or reading an article online. So it's like our generation is really hungry for it. Um, we just don't always know that we are hungry for it until we get the information, so yeah. How do you guys think that students or people in society uh, learning about these issues, critical race theory, how do you think that that benefits the community? Mm. Yeah, um, 
I think there's like unlimited benefits to it. Um, I mean, when you realize these issues, when you're passionate about them, everybody is able to work together to help solve these issues, to help work on these issues and collaborative solutions. Like a lot of solutions in the past have been very like band-aid solutions, slap it on, it's temporary, does not fix the issue. Um, but when you have multiple people who are aware about a certain subject and passionate about it and want to work on it, then you get all these ideas, all these perspectives, and you can actually work to solve the root cause of the issue and not just slapping something on it and calling it a day. Um, and then also just when all people are empowered in society, then society flourishes, you know? So it's a win-win situation for everybody. That part. Yes, most <laughs> definitely. I have nothing to add except um, that it also just helps foster empathy and understanding as well. Sure, yeah. sure. Uh, I want to ask you guys and Josh, uh, besides CRT, what are some of the other ways we can help create more inclusive societies? Um, this is something that I've been um, personally working on recently, um, and I think including black history, yeah. um, even all the way to like pre-colonial Africa, is extremely important. And even just like everybody's history, so like Asian history, Pacific Islander history, all of it. Um, I think that it helps us to not look at things through such a Eurocentric lens. And I feel like once we remove that lens, then everything is so much more freed and open up. Um, but just as like a black woman, black history is super important for Americans to be able to understand their past and how to move forward from that past. I think it's extremely important. Most how, definitely. And how do you think? Yeah. What, what, what do you think are some other ways mm -hmm. that we can help have yeah. a more inclusive society besides yeah. critical race yeah. theory? What are some other ways? Um, something I've been thinking about a lot through CYC as well is like dispelling echo chambers and something it can be incredibly uncomfortable and I find myself really easily falling back into echo chambers of people who uphold my same beliefs, um, which in a social justice sphere is of course really like a breath of fresh air and really energizing to be around people who have those similar ethics and morals. Um, but I'm also realizing by staying so confined into one perspective, it's so limiting and it's not going to help me understand people who are on the other side of things or people who don't understand the need for critical race theory or outright opposed to it. So I'm really interested in, um, I don't know what ways this would happen because America is so polarized right now, but um, fostering conversations where we don't need to change each other's minds about things, but instead just understand. And I know there's a lot of emotional labor that can go into that and a lot of smaller subsets and things that we would have to address, but um, I would just love to have that space where we're not also stuck in our beliefs and unopened to other perspectives and change. Right. Well, it's conversations, I think. Exactly. I think yeah. it's, yes. it's these right here, mm -hmm. what we're exactly. doing right Precisely. now. You know what I'm saying? Small mm -hmm. conversations and yeah. accountability. Like Definitely. What, what, what you know, what you think you know. Mm -hmm. It's funny to hear you uh, talk about like the, the race thing. I, you know, whenever I hear the critical race theory, mm -hmm. I think about like uh, water fountains, black only water fountains, like mm -hmm. when things were really, really, really openly racist, right? And around like 1970, they started embracing Black History Month. Yeah. They meaning like schools, America, right? Mm -hmm. It was just 1970, that's not even long mm -hmm. ago. I was born in 1982. Mm -hmm. So 12 years before I was born is when they started embracing African American history. We got Black History Month, right? Yeah. So what's going on for the other 11 months? Yeah, yeah there are other months um, that are dedicated to other minority and race groups, but obviously they're not like advertised or shown as much. Um, they really have to take the load on themselves to show people their history. Um, it's not actively shown to other people. And I do think that learning about all history, not just black history, is super important because there's so much intersectionality. You know, like if you ignore one side, you may miss like the final thing that will help you come to the solution. Right. Did you guys have any questions for Josh? Oh. Or so questions many. for me? Yes. Or I guess just a question. It's thinking. A, it's an open dialogue. Yes, I do. I have an open dialogue <laughs> question. Um, 
So Angela Davis has this concept of like radical imagination and like dreaming into the future that is possible. And I would love to hear both your perspective, Cedric, and Joshua's perspective on like what you were dreaming into th for the future, especially as it relates to critical race. Theory. What I'm dreaming into the future right now? Yes. I just want everybody to stop and listen to each other. Yeah. I think uh, that nobody, I said in another episode that uh, Everybody just signs the paperwork. Yeah. Nobody reads the paperwork. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody just signs the mm -hmm. iTunes agreement. You don't read it. Yes. And, and that happens <laughs> from the highest levels to the mm -hmm. lowest levels. So for me, dreaming into the future is just like, we should be paying more attention. Mm. Yeah. I should pay more attention to you. I should listen yeah. to you. I should be accountable for who I am and, and, and who you are and how the exchange goes. Mm. Uh, any, did you have any? Did you want to? Yeah, I would answer love to question? hear Olivia what you think. Oh, oh, answering your question. If you want, or another question. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I just echo um, what he said. Yeah, I don't think I have anything to add. I think listening, um, empathy, mm -hmm. uh, and just being able to acknowledge your boundaries and the emotional mm -hmm. labor that's involved is all important to consider. Yeah. Josh, what do you dream for into the future? Yeah, you know, I, I think as, a, as an educator, um, I dream of a classroom where, in, in a school, where all students have true equity and access um, to, to a, a great education and not playing any of these games of school choice, um, you know, moving on to the certain side of town so your kids can go to school at one school um all the all the politics and 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 rabbit jumping that's needed to to get students into a good school that you could simply walk your kid to the corner and have them get a great education there as they would anywhere else in the city um and to be able to do that with confidence and love and community and to know that um, that all students, despite where they come from um, or what their what their life's realities have given them, that they all have access to do whatever it is that they want to do or need to do to get to that next level. Um, that's what I dream of. Well, what a great way to end the very last episode of the season. You can watch this episode and the rest of them anytime pbs12.org. I want to thank you two for being here. I'm Cedric Avenue, and for all of us here at PBS 12, good night.